Welcome back everyone and welcome to kind of the next big chunk of this semester and from this point until we get towards the end of the semester we're just going to be discussing the various phyla of animal life that exists on this planet. We're going to start with unicellular eukaryotes. They're not technically considered to be animals but they are eukaryotic and it's kind of the most simple form of where kind of animals came from. So we're going to start with unicellular eukaryotes and this is chapter 11 in your book. Unicellular eukaryotes are often referred to as protozoans, so I may use those terms interchangeably throughout this presentation. Um, protozoans are some of the earliest forms of eukaryotic life that we found on this planet. There are fossil records of protozoans going back 100 million years ago, which is insane, right? So these were these are hypothesized to be the first eukaryotic cells that some ancestor, common ancestor for all animal eukaryotic cells began as this kind of protozoan. And uh, protozoans came about through, through, through a process called endosymbiosis. And this process is how we end up getting some of the organelles that we have today, including mitochondria and chloroplast. And so uh, we're going to go through this image here to kind of explain what the process of endosymbiosis is. So Generally, when you think about um, one cell engulfing another cell, it's for nutrients, right? So the larger cell will then uh, engulf a smaller cell and then digest it and eat it, right? But in this case, what happens is our larger cell will engulf our smaller cell. In this case, our smaller cell is a cyanobacteria. But instead of digesting it and using it for nutrients, that cyanobacteria became a part of that host cell. So it just kind of resided in the cytoplasm. And so it became a kind of symbiotic relationship between this larger cell and then our, our cyanobacteria. So this is how um, we believe in, in, in that we were able to get the plastids and mitochondria that we have today. There's another way that protozoans can get organelles and it's through secondary endosymbiosis. So when a larger cell engulfs a smaller cell like a cyanobacteria, that's primary endosymbiosis. In secondary endosymbiosis, a third cell will then come and engulf the cell that's already engulfed another cell. So if you look at this image here, we have our even larger yellow cell is going to it has then engulfed our pink cell which already engulfed our cyanobacteria right so in this way this is termed as secondary endosymbiosis and both of these can occur in protozoans um, which kind of convolutes the taxonomic um, rankings or the taxonomic profile of uh, protozoans. So like I mentioned before, protozoans are not considered to be animals. Um, when you look back at our first lecture and some of the classifications for being an animal, one of the first ones is that an animal is multicellular. These are unicellular eukaryotes. So they are not animals, um, but they are kind of the base. Um, our common ancestor was likely a unicellular eukaryote. So in order to talk about animals, we really kind of just have to discuss the, these organisms. The protozoans are at the protoplasmic uh, stage of complexity and then most of them are microscopic. Some are not but the vast majority of them are. Protozoans are ubiquitous in nature. They're all over the place. Uh, lakes, soil, human body, they're everywhere. Um, but with that said, they also have a narrow range where they can live. So they're all over the place but they can only really survive when there's moisture present um, and certain environmental conditions are favorable for them. Um, and what a favorable conditions are varies for each uh, species, but um, they do each have like a narrow range. And um, as you'll see throughout this textbook and as throughout this presentation, there are a variety of protozoans out there um, and they're, they each have so many different characteristics and this is actually why it's hard for taxonomists to uh, follow the lineage of protozoans because like we mentioned before you can have primary and secondary endosymbiosis 
which kind of confuses things. And you also have other limited characteristics to go by because sometimes some protozoans are a little bit flexible in how they, they live their life. Um, and we'll go through some of those in the following slides. And also convergent evolution is very, very common in uh, protozoans. And so this also makes it very difficult to uh, follow the evolutionary lineage of these, these organisms as you may think that a trait is homologous, well, really it's analogous, um, uh, analogous character. So the taxonomists have been a, really been relying a lot more lately on molecular analysis to uh, differentiate different phyla and different species of protozoans. And so as we're going through this presentation, I really want you to just really understand the bigger picture um, characteristics of protozoans and some key protozoan um, species as we go throughout. Don't get too bogged down in a lot of the super duper fine details. Just make sure you understand the big picture things, especially the things that we're going to go through in this PowerPoint. So like I mentioned, there, is, there are so many different protozoans out there and there's so many different characteristics. And I don't want you to memorize everything on this um, this slide, but I really wanted to show you just how diverse the, this um, category of organisms is. So most um, are microscopic, like we mentioned before. Um, they have no germ layers, right, because they're unicellular. They don't have any germ layers. They do have specialized organelles, which is how they're able to survive, right? Everything that is key to the survival of a unicellular organism is maintained within its own cytoplasm. So specialized organelles are essential. And then, um, like I mentioned, they're all unicellular. So now from there, there's so much diversity. You have some that are spherically symmetrical, some that are radial, some are bilateral. Some are sessile, where some are free floating. Some have cilia, some have flagella, some have pseudopodia. Um, some have an exoskeleton, some have an endoskeleton, some have none, and those are, con those are called naked. Some are commensal with other organisms, um, some are mutualistic with other organisms, and some are parasitic. Whether they can be autotrophic, heterotrophic, or mixotrophic, they can live on land and in water, they can be uh, reproduced asexually or sexually, right? And these are just some of the characteristics that vary between these different um, phyla of um, protozoans. So you can imagine how difficult it is to classify and identify all of these and categorize them. And so um, we're gonna go for the next couple of slides through a couple of characteristics that can sometimes be used uh, in order to, um, by taxonomists, in order to categorize uh, these various protozoans. So one of those categories is through nutrient acquisition. So how does the protozoan go about getting its carbon? And so we have two types of classifications. You have protozoans that are considered animal-like and some that are considered plant-like. And this is based on if they're heterotrophic or autotrophic. So do they have to eat something else to get their carbon or they, can they synthesize their own carbon through uh, photosynthesis? Those uh, heterotrophic protozoans that are able to, um, to obtain their prey or obtain their carbon through phagocytosis are called phagotrophs. And they can do this either with a cytostome, which is a kind of like a designated mouth area, or some of them like paramecium have like a cytostome. They have a designated kind of mouth section, a mouth. Um, but you can be like an amoeba where they can uh, do undergo phagocytosis almost anywhere on the body. So an ex a walkthrough, basic walkthrough of phagocytosis is uh, exhibited here. So let's say this is our amoeba. I don't spell so well, so excuse my spelling. But our amoeba then uh, sees a signals a bacteria in the area. So it senses that there's a bacteria nearby. And it will use receptors on its uh, cell membrane to bind that bacteria and bring it in into a vesicle, right? And that vesicle is often called a, ph a phagosome. So phagocytosis, phagosome. And um, that phagosome will then be combined with a lysosome. So a lysosome will fuse with the phagosome and the lysosome will re release all of its enzymatic contents into the phagosome and digest that bacteria. And as that bacteria is being digested, 
smaller and smaller molecules, well, like the base, uh, base sugars and proteins and things like that, will diffuse out of the phagosome and um, into the cytoplasm so that the uh, amoeba, in this case, can go ahead and use those nutrients. Anything that's not digestible, so that's what that is indicated here by these like red uh, dots, any undigestible material or material that will be considered waste is then removed via exocytosis from the cell. So that phagosome vesicle will fuse with the cell wall and will release all of the undigested contents back out into the environment. You can also have heterotrophs that are osmotrophs. So instead of doing uh, phagocytosis, they basically use passive and active diffusion to bring in nutrients from the environment. And this is when they're already kind of already broken down. So when you're doing phagocytosis, these can be larger particles, but osmotrophs, they have to be kind of already broken down nutrients that are in the environment. And they also can bring in um, nutrients through penocytosis. And so this is where um, I, you can bring in a vesicle, kind of like we talked about before, but it's generally just water and liquid and things from the environment. And if there's nutrients in there, then that's how they're also bringing them in. Um, in addition to heterotrophs and aerotrophs, we also have mixotrophs. And so there are some protozoans that can do a little bit of both. Um, they can do them both at the same time. They can do them both depending on the conditions that they're, uh, their environmental conditions that they're under. Um, it just depends. So you can start seeing this variability in even in just how they get their carbon source. Um, this is one way that uh, taxonomists have tried to start identifying, classifying the uh, protozoans. However, it's not really a reliable character because of what I just talked about. Some can undergo autotroph autotrophic um, activities and some can do undergo heterotrophic and then some can switch between them depending on the conditions. So um, it, like in a euglena, if you put it in the dark, it goes from being autotrophic to heterotrophic. And so if you found one in the environment in the dark, you might think, oh, it's heterotrophic all the time, but in actuality, it's autotrophic by nature. So, and then you can also get a euglena to give up its chloroplast altogether. So it's not really the most reliable character to look at nutrient acquisition, but this is one kind of way that people have tried to kind of put this tree together. Another characteristic that can be used to uh, discern different protozoans is through the mode of locomotion. So do they get around using a cilia, flagella, or pseudopodia? And so starting with cilia and flagella, um, we have, this is uh, facilitated by microtubules. And so this image is a little small, so I'm going to try to draw a little bit here. So in um, cilia and flagella, we have two microtubules that lie right next to each other, right? And then um, there are nine sets of microtubules around that are arranged in like a circle. And so you can see here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, okay? And so that's where the nine comes from. The plus two is from the two microtubules that are situated in the center here. And so um, we also have, in addition to the microtubules, a protein called dynein that is, and it's, it's it identified here in this picture as this like purple kind of C shape, but we have dynein on one of each of the microtubule uh, dimers here. And so that dynein is kind of next to the next set of microtubules and we have another dynein and the next set of microtubules, right? So that keeps going around in a circle. And the dynein, using uh, ATP hydrolysis, will walk up and down the microtubules. And this will cause that wavy motion that we associate with eukaryotic flagellar movement. So just as a reminder, eukaryote flagellas move in a wavy motion. Prokaryote flagellas are in a spiral motion. So this wavy motion is actually due to um, a mechanism that's called referred to as the sliding microtubule hypothesis. So when you have one microtubule is moving against the other one, it causes it to bend and bend, so it waves, right? The, um, these microtubules extend the entire length of the flagella, and then they meet at a kinetosome or basal body 
that's inside of the cytoplasm of the cell. The cilia and flagella um, can vary in number, right? So not all eukaryotic, uh, unicellular eukaryotes have one flagella, some have two, some have four. They can vary depending on the different species. And um, cilia, you know, are all over hair-like structures and the number of those and their placement can also vary depending on the species. And both cilia and flagella are used for a variety of things. They've been used for feeding, they can be used for reproduction, um, excretion of waste, and maintaining osmoregulation. So they play a very important role in not just locomotion, but in other processes of protozoa. Next, we have our um, pseudopodia. So pseudopodia are a little bit different. They are primarily composed of actin filaments that will polymerize on one end and depolymerize on the other. And we'll kind of go through some of those steps in a second. Um, it's also, they're also used for locomotion and feeding, and they come in various shapes. So from your textbook, you'll see that some of them are lobular, which are kind of more like what we would think about with an amoeba, where they're kind of dense. And then some can be more spike shaped and thin. Um, they're just different, various different types of uh, pseudopodia out there. And the general mechanism on how the pseudopodia work is that you have this area right here called the hyaline cap. Okay, this area here. And this is kind of the leading end of the pseudopodia. So this is kind of the direction of where the organism is going. And so the hyaline cap will extend and then the endoderm will kind of flow into where that extension is. And as it's flowing into there, it's carrying actin filaments, which is exhibited here, the little lollipop structures. It's pulling those actin filaments um, towards the hyaline cap and then kind of out and around um, to where the plasma membrane is. When it gets to the plasma membrane, the actin will start to polymerize and form kind of that structure to help um, provide structure to that pseudopodia, to where it's going, right? And then as the extension is uh, being pulled out and actin is being polymerized on the leading end, on the back end, so this end of our, our organism, actin is being depolymerized. And so um, that kind of will remove that solid structure from the, the trailing end, the trailing end, and um, will allow for you to kind of push everything towards the hyaline cap, so towards the direction you want to go. Um, the myosin proteins, which are shown here and here, are what's kind of responsible for pulling that trailing end towards the hyaline cap. And um, to see a really cool video of this um, at the very, very end of this PowerPoint, click on the pseudopodia uh, picture and you can actually see the internal components moving towards the, the hyaline cap, towards where the pseudopodia are going. And you can see kind of the, oh, you can't really see the depolymerization on the trailing end, but you can kind of visualize how that whole process works. So really, really good video. Um, if you want to see this in action, I definitely recommend it. So an, another way that you can kind of start looking at different um, categories of protozoans is through how they undergo cellular respiration. So as I mentioned before, a lot of protozoans have mitochondria. Um, this is a result of endosymbiosis. And it can be, depending on the different cases, it can be through primary or secondary endosymbiosis. And mitochondria, as you might remember, I hope you remember, um, are prokaryotic in origin, and they actually have their own separate DNA that's separate from the DNA of the host, if you will, or the, the main primary cell that has their DNA in the nucleus. And so you, you can find mitochondrial DNA um, sequences that have over time moved to the nucleus, but mitochondria also have their own uh, separate DNA typically. It might be smaller than it was, the, their genome might be smaller than what it was when they first were um, engulfed, but there is some DNA still there. And one interesting thing is that generally when we're looking at textbooks, you might see um, a mitochondria look like this, or mitochondria that might look like this in your textbook, but there are actually various uh, structures of mitochondria. Some are long, like elongated, 
along the entire length of an organism like you see in trypanosomes. Some do look like this bean shape. Some look nothing like these. Um, there's various different morphologies of the mitochondria. And there are also their cristae, which are these kind of invaginations here, can also differ in structure. So I put this image here to show you just three examples of how the mitochondrial cristae can vary. And the type of mitochondria uh, cristae that you have, or the type of mitochondria that you have, is a homologous character. So it's passed on over time from a uh, parent to offspring. And so uh, this is one more reliable way of characterizing different protozoans. Some protozoans don't have a mitochondria. Some use something called a hydro hydrogenosome. And um, this is allowing some protozoans to undergo cellular respiration in the absence of oxygen, so in anaerobic conditions. And it is hypothesized to have evolved from a mitochondria. Another organelle that has been um, that it has evolved from a mitochondria is the kinetoplast. And so some protozoans have this um, mitochondrial DNA, like very dense circular um, area of mitochondrial DNA that's located near their um, their kinetosome for their flagella. And uh, trypanosomes are one good example of this. And um, this organelle was also derived from the mitochondria and is used when trying to uh, identify different phyla of protozoans. So in addition to mitochondria, we also have plastids, and these are organelles that contain photosynthetic pigments. So one example that you'll probably be familiar with from you know, basic bio are chloroplasts, which have chlorophyll A, B, and C in them, um, but they don't always have to be green. So a good example here um, is this red algae here. So red algae is actually not a plant. It is, um, it's not a unicellular eukaryote, um, but it is a, a form of eukaryote and it doesn't have, um, doesn't have a green pigmentation. It actually has a, a red pigment, right? So it doesn't always have to be green. But this uh, plastids were uh, obtained as a result of endosymbiosis, kind of like we mentioned in the first slide there. And pigment type um, may be homologous, but it may be through secondary endosymbiosis. So the type of pigment um, that a protozoan has is not necessarily the most reliable characteristic when trying to um, kind of look at their lineage, but it's one characteristic to keep in mind. And this bottom image here is just showing you that not, um, I like this image because it's showing you that not all organisms just have one um, chloroplast, actually many don't, they just have many chloroplasts here that help these autotrophic um, organisms to get their carbon through photosynthesis. So reproduction in prokaryotes can be through two mechanisms. Um, the first we're gonna talk about is through asexual reproduction. And this can be through binary fission or multiple fission. And uh, the difference is binary, you end up with two organisms at the end. Multiple fission is when you end up with more than two. And so that essentially you just have, instead of the nucleus dividing into two, the nucleus will divide into four, eight, 10, uh, four, eight, 16 or whatever. And that's how you end up with, um, at the end of the day, as many nuclei as you have is how many organisms that you end up with, right? Um, one way of binary fission is through budding. And uh, you'll see budding come up a couple times throughout the semester. And it's essentially when, um, instead of like in this image, we have two from, from one parent, we have two um, now offspring, if you will, um, that are clones of each other that are of identical size and shape. The, in budding, you have one larger cell and then one smaller cell. And this smaller cell, once it detaches, it will grow right into a larger normal adult sized cell okay um when you have asexual reproduction protozoans is through mitosis this type of mitosis is different from what you know of in animal cells um, there are some differences with nucleus structure and things like that and spindle fi spindle formation um, there's a lot of different types of mitosis that can occur depending on the type of protozoan but it is different from the normal animal cell um, type of mit mitosis we think of. Um, and then when you have asexual reproduction, 
it's cloning essentially you end up with two identical offspring so this parent uh trypanosome here and the two resulting offspring trypanosomes are genetically identical they're basically clones you can also have sexual reproduction in um, protozoans and this is a good means of genetic recombination and um, this is like you normally would think about sexual reproduction we have gametes from two uh, ha haploid um, two diploid cells will make haploid gametes that will then fertilize um, undergo fertilization right so um, and when they fuse those two pronuclei from the gametes will make a diploid organism or a zygote right and so um, just to make things more complicated in sexual reproduction um, for protozoans, some organisms, some protozoans have a haploid adult phase and some of them have a diploid and some of them undergo a little bit of both depending on the generation. So they might alternate between haploid and diploid um, adult phases. And um, this is due to when meiosis occurs. So some will undergo meiosis before um, fertilization, which will give you a diploid adult generally, right? Because two haploid pronuclei will make a diploid zygote, or they can have meiosis occur after fertilization. So then you're ending up with a diploid organism splitting into haploid um, offspring. So um, that's how you can kind of alternate. And then you can also have syngamy versus autogamy. So syngamy is what we normally think of. One organism produces um, one gamete, another organism produces another gamete, and they meet from two different cells. But in autogamy, the haploid pronuclei meet within the same organism. So you basically fertilize your own pronucleus. And uh, another way that you can have cells um, reproduce sexually is through conjugation. So this is kind of similar to conjugation in, in bacteria, but not quite the same. But just as a general uh, gist, we have two cells. Let me try to draw two. You got two cells. These are my trypanosomes. Um, or better, better yet, it'd be a paramecium or something like that. But um, in any case, our two cells will interact with each other, come in close interaction with one another, and they will exchange cytoplasmic content. So they'll exchange DNA. So if they have a nucleus, and this is, let's say it's our genetic material, um, they'll you know duplicate their genetic material, and then they'll swap. I probably should have drawn this in different colors, but let's say this one is green. Okay, and then they'll swap genetic information. So now this one has its own genetic material and it's got some genetic material from the cell that it uh, conjugated with. And same thing with this cell. This cell has its one copy of its own genetic material and a copy of the cell that it exchanged material with. So just remember that essentially conjugation is when two organisms come together physically to exchange genetic material. So another interesting element of protozoans are some of them can form cysts and essentially a cyst is almost like a spore. Um, it's highly resistant and dormant cell and it's really characterized by the presence of some sort of self-produced wall. So in this image here, um, I just really wanted to show you this image to show you how it says O cyst wall. This wall here, this blue wall, protects this oocyst from all types of uh, dam danger and damage in the environment. So as a cyst, um, it protects you from food deficiency. So if food is rare in the environment, some protozoans will go into a cyst form. And then once food is present, they'll come out of the cyst form and um, be more infectious again or you know survive again. It can protect you from drying out, so desiccation, um, from changes in osmotic osmotic pressure so a lot of times when a protozoan especially ones that are parasites will go from one organism to another like let's say from the gut of a mosquito to the salivary gland of a mosquito to your bloodstream there's a vast difference in osmotic pressure in those three areas and so a cyst can help with um, survival once it gets 
between um, different osmotic regions. Um, it can also help with decreased oxygen concentrations, um, changes in pH, and also changes in temperature. So essentially, if the conditions aren't right, like we talked about before, the conditions must be right in order for a protozoan to survive, including moisture, temperature, whatever that protozoan needs um, to survive, those conditions must be met in order for it to uh, function and live properly. But some cysts, I mean, some protozoans, if those conditions aren't right, can form cysts. Not all of them can do that, but some of them can. There are many clades of protozoans out there, and um, your textbook goes into vast detail on some of these clades. And if you're interested in any of them in particular, I highly encourage you to go ahead and read more in detail about them. But for the next couple of slides, I'm just going to present a few to you that I think were very, very important for you to know about, some you might already be familiar with, and um, some that have some um, economic impacts or, um, you know, we care about a lot. You might have heard about a lot in the news and things like that. So the first phyla we're going to talk about are the diplomonads, and uh, they have no mitochondria, and but they do have mitochondrial genes in the nucleus, so it's hypothesized that they lost their mitochondria at some point, but um, the, I think their structure is quite interesting. Um, it's very, very unique. So this image here actually shows you kind of the, the, the shape and they actually look kind of cute. I would never want to get this <laughs> protozoan though because it causes severe diarrhea. So this image is of Giardia and Giardia, many of you might know is traveler's diarrhea. It's the cause of that. Um, it basically lives in the digestive tract of organisms as a parasite. And for many people, it can be asymptomatic when they're present in you, or they can cause, like I mentioned, severe diarrhea. Um, and this is uh, passed from host to host via a fecal oral route. So if you go out in the woods and you drink some water from a stream and it's contaminated with sewage, um, human waste, or even animal waste, um, you can end up with this, this parasite. So that's why it's called traveler's diarrhea. Next, we have euglenozoa. And uh, some interesting features, unique features about them is one, they have the, a presence of a nuclei during mitosis. And this is actually a homologous character. So how I mentioned in mitosis in uh, protozoans is different from what we normally associate with animal cells. This is one example. The nuclei remains intact during uh, mitosis in these, uh, these cells. They also have bicoid uh, my mitochondrial cristae, so that's also another homologous characteristic that uh, of this uh, phylum. There are two subphylums in Euglena that that are um, of interest. There's Euglenidia, um, and then we have Kinetoplasta. And so Euglenida, sorry, these sometimes it's a little bit hard. Um, have a chloroplast and a red eye spot to sense light. So this upper image is what I'm referring to. And so they're green because they have a lot of chloroplast in them. And they're so obviously they're phototrophic, um, autotrophic. And they have these cool little red spots here, which let's see if I can draw an arrow too. And that red spot helps them to find light sources and orient to light. And you can imagine that's very important when you are photos, uh, photosynthetic organism you under well you have ability to undergo photosynthesis right you need light so that red eye spot helps them to find light where they need to be in order to survive one interesting thing about them and i had kind of mentioned this before is that these euglena can uh switch from autotrophic to heterotrophic means of uh, getting their carbon when you put them in the dark and you can actually if you put them in the dark long enough or if you mutate them you can actually make them get rid of their chloroplast altogether and switch to heterotrophic a mechanism of, of survival um, then when they're heterotrophic they're saprophytic i mean saprozoic um, so that's one really cool interesting thing about uh, these organisms and then you have your kinetoplasta and all of these are parasites and they have a kinetoplast. So as we talked about before, that dense area of DNA that's kind of situated near the um, side of the kinetosome of the flagella is the kinetoplast. So all of the uh, parasites within this, this subphyla have a kinetoplast. Some that you may be familiar with that fit within this subphylum are Trypanosoma brucei, which is the 
uh, agent that causes African sleeping sickness, and this is transmitted via the vector of the tsetse fly. Also, Trypanosoma cruzi, which causes Chagas disease via the vector of a kissing bug. And then we have leishmania, which uh, they all cause leishmaniasis, and they're transmitted via sand flies. Um, leishmania is really um, relevant to anybody who wants to go into veterinary medicine. So you might be familiar with this parasite in uh, particularly dogs. We have ciliates. Um, ciliates include paramecium, and there's actually a video that I included at the end of this PowerPoint of a paramecium moving around and, and feeding, um, which I, I highly recommend. I think it's kind of cool to watch. But uh, they get their name, obviously, they have cilia at some point in their life cycle. And so the cilia, um, just as a reminder, are these little hair like structures that are kind of surrounding the entire um, organism, in, in this case, in the paramecium. Some of them have cilia at different stages and at different places. And then earlier I had mentioned the cytostome. This is the cytostome. So it's kind of like their, their mouth area. Um, another interesting thing about them is they have two nuclei. So they have a macronucleus and a micronucleus. And that's shown in this picture, this image here. This is their macronucleus and this is their micronucleus. The genes um, in the macronucleus are the only ones that are transcribed and translated into proteins. The micronucleus really only plays a role in sexual reproduction between paramecium. So um, in your book, they go into more detail on how um, two paramecium undergo conjugation and this all that whole process involves mac micronuclei. Nuclei. Um, and yeah, then we have our dinoflagellates and these are some of my favorite microorganisms to look at because they come in so many shapes and sizes and colors. And so this image here is actually just showing you just a few of the various structures, mor uh, morphologies that we can see in dinoflagellates. Uh, their dinoflagellates come in two kind of varieties. We have our um, autotrophic and pigmented dinoflagellates, and then you can have heterotrophic and colorless dinoflagellates. But in either case, they're really cool to look at. Um, all of them have two flagella, and they're extremely important in marine environments. Um, they're the base of a lot of um, food for various uh, marine life. Um, but they're also a very, very important when we're talking about coral reefs. So dinoflagellates are uh, the zooxanthellae in the tissues of coral reefs. So we'll talk about more about corals and their relationship with uh, zooxanthellae later, but uh, just know that dinoflagellates are very important to the survival of corals and anemones um, due to a mutualistic relationship with those organisms. Some of these can also be bioluminescent. And if you've ever been out, um, especially like to a bioluminescent bay, like in Puerto Rico and things like that, you can see how cool it is when you run your hand through the water and these things kind of twinkle in the, in the moonlight. Um, on the opposite end of how cool and beautiful dinoflagellates are is they can also call red tide. So the image below is showing you red tide. It doesn't actually necessarily always have to be red, but um, this one, this image is actually is red and all that red stuff is actually a toxin that is produced from dinoflagellates and it's not toxic to them but it's toxic to wildlife and it's toxic to humans and so high concentrations of dinoflagellates sometimes will just bloom um, due to certain environmental conditions increased nutrients increase increased temperatures uh, and light and things like that will cause a bloom in dinoflagellates and when they bloom they produce these toxins and that increases um, the concentration of the toxin in the water increases with the increasing concentration of these dinoflagellates right and so that toxin when ingested by fish um, and other marine life can kill them and it's also harmful um, to people as well if you are ingesting that so you know you can't swim during red tides and things like that also it can be harmful economically um, as well as environmentally so a lot of uh, shoreline um, economies rely on tourism 
and on uh, food like fish and, and, and mussels and things like that, filter feeders from these environments. And when red tide comes through, people can't go into the beaches. No one wants to go into the beaches during red tide. And also um, the wildlife is dying. And then also some of those filter feeder uh, animals like mussels and clams and things like that, they um, will pick up a lot of that toxin and the dinoflagellates in their in their bodies and so you actually can't eat um, any of those bivalves those uh, mussels and things like that that come from areas that are experiencing red tide because it's concentrated toxin basically in those tissues and when you eat it it will make you very 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 sick so um, as beautiful as dinoflagellates can be they can also be uh, kind of an enemy uh, we have our apicomplexans and uh, most of these are endoparasites. They actually have a uh, complex called the apical complex, which is a set of organelles that are actually specifically designed to penetrate host tissues. So they are really good at being an endoparasite. And an example of this, uh, two examples of this that you'll be familiar with are toxoplasmo toxoplasma gondii, which causes toxoplasmosis, um, which if anyone in, you know, in this class has ever known someone who's pregnant or has had a baby, you know that um, you wanna stay away from cats and things like that um, when there's toxoplasmosis because cats are actually the desired host of this parasite. And when uh, pregnant women get exposed to toxoplasma gondii, um, they can cause birth defects and miscarriages and things like that. So that's one way that people might be familiar with it. Also, um, plasmodia. Everyone pretty much knows about plasmodia because they cause one of the most devastating diseases in humans, it's malaria, right? So um, these are two prime examples of apicomplexans. Then we have uh, Vera de Plante. And I mentioned these because I think they're really, really interesting. Um, these kind of fall under the kind of plant-like um, plant -like protozoans. Um, they can be unicellular, they can be multicellular, and they can be colonial. So, you know, unicellular by itself, multicellular, they have to survive together. In a colonial form, it's when we were talking about the um, kind of the cell level of complexity, where we have multiple cells that interact and they all play a role in each other's survival, but they're all still separate individual cells. And a good example of a colonial cell um, organization is this uh, organism here called Volvox. And essentially all of these little balls in here have cells and they all kind of interact with one another, but they and they facilitate, facilitate each other's survival, but they're not bound to each other like tissues or anything like that. And um, green algae, which is in this image down here, uh, all that green stuff is green algae and green algae just as a reminder is not a plant it's actually a protozoan and it um, covers can be found covering rocks in various areas in uh, shallow uh, waters so those are two examples um, that fall underneath this um, phylum the last two we're going to discuss are our miabozoas and uh, Apistaconta. So amoebozoas include our amoebas. Um, they include plasmodial slime molds. I'm gonna include a video at the end of this PowerPoint so you can see what a plasmodial slime mold is if you've never seen one. They're really cool to watch as they kind of travel through um, the floor of forests and things like that. So I recommend watching that. And also uh, interamoeba hippolytica, which you might be familiar with because it is one cause of dysentery and it causes abscesses when it moves to other areas within the body. And so uh, just take a look at the videos of the um, plasmodial slime mold and the amoeba to get a better idea of, of what kind of organisms fit within this, this phylum. And then we have our obstaconta and um, this includes the coanoflagellates, and these are a really good segue to our next um, talk. And they are a sister taxa to animals, and you'll see um, when you look at the first um, phylogenetic tree in your book, you'll see them kind of they're right next to where we start looking at animals. So they're the sister group to animals, and they're similar to the uh, 
coanocytes in sponges. And in the next presentation, we'll really talk more about you know the coanocytes and sponges and how these two things are similar. But um, we often study uh, coanoflagellates when we're looking to learn more about multicellularity and how it developed in animals. So um, we'll be spending a little bit more time in detail on these um, particular protozoans in the next uh, presentation on sponges. Okay, with that said, we've reached the end of our discussion on protozoans. Just as a reminder, I really want you to just make sure that you're um, getting a general gist of the diversity out there, protozoans, and some key, um, some key processes and, and characteristics of the this group of organisms. So go ahead and read chapter 11, um, chapter 11 sections 1.1 and then in within 1.2 uh, read the sections on locomotion, um, on mitochondria, nutrient um, acquisition, uh, reproduction, and cyst formation. Uh, I encourage you to read all the other content as well, but these are kind of areas that I really want you to focus on understanding. And then also from 11.3, if there are any protozoans that you were really, really interested in, it could be ones that I've mentioned, we ones that you knew about and, and some other time, it could be anything that you just were like, I always want to know more. I highly encourage you to go ahead and read uh, sections in 11.3 and familiarize yourself with them. Um, protozoans are extremely interesting. They're so diverse. And so it's a good opportunity to learn more. And then also reading uh, section 11.4. And then any of the uh, videos here, I recommend um, watching them. They're really cool. I try to pick ones where you can really kind of see how the organism moves around and how it functions. So I highly recommend that. Excellent. Well, I'll see you in the next stage talking about sponges next. Bye.